At last, we come to the end. Hesperos is more difficult to understand than the Phoenix, but the steps aren't much more difficult to execute once you know what you're doing. If you can kill the bird, you can kill Dracula at home. After all, what is a boss? Just a miserable little pile of mechanics. My name's Vera, and I'm here to show you how to whip it good in 15 minutes or less. The Party Finder has been using a paste bin to distribute the diagrams and strategies for the fight, which will be in the description. The setup for the door boss includes a spread pattern for poison peanax, healer stacks for fire, and tower assignments. Try very hard to not bring 3 melee to P4S. It's bad for a number of reasons. As usual, the first thing thrown at you is a raid wide, Decolation. It's lethal if unmitigated, but only just. Use only a few tools on each one. Hesperos will do two sets of blood rakes, targeting either tanks and healers or DPS. Blood rakes do moderate damage and make you weak to an upcoming mechanic. Thinking about mechanics in the negative like this may take some getting used to. Director's Bologna will infect four players with coronavirus. The coof can be passed off onto other players by violating social distancing. Once you've passed it, natural immunity will prevent you from contracting it again. Whichever rolls did not get hit by the second blood rake needs to pick up the virus. Two DPS and two tanks and healers will always get the initial application, so the mechanic is always half solved out of the box. Second blood rake players will stack tight to the south of the boss, immediately passing the virus to each other. Then whoever needs to pick up the debuff simply steps into the stack and takes it out. Do this one at a time and from different directions to avoid some weird situation of passing it between you and dooming a stacked player. You have to be right on top of each other though, so this isn't super likely. Next, Hesperos will put down four tethers which need to be picked up and spread out by the players who were not hit by the first Blood Rake. You can get picked to do both mechanics, one or neither. Once the debuff has been passed to the appropriate roles, tether players will step forward, form another stack, grab them, and move away. I like to say no tether out loud to myself if I get blood raked first, and no virus if I get hit by the second. We are evolved to very easily commit speech to short-term memory, so take advantage of it. Another decolation will follow hot on the heels of the tethers. This is a good one to reprisal, etc. in case heals are a bit slow. A two-hit tank buster is up next. Both hits will apply a brief vulnerability. You will do three of these throughout the fight, so if you don't have warrior privilege, you will need to swap in between hits for one of them. Tanks should work out between themselves which ones they want to immune and swap for. He will then set the stage, turning the room into the four pretty colors you remember from normal mode. If you're at about 88% here, you've got the damage. Quickly drag the boss here between fire and lightning. This is the best spot for overall uptime, and be quick about it, he won't be mobile for very long. His penex is pretty hard. To handle, I mean. I mean... Anyway. You're gonna get two in quick succession. They mostly behave the same, but there are a few very important differences. First, the wells in the middle of each square are danger zones. They won't hurt you instantly, so you can get knocked over them or put a fit in for a tick and be fine. Second, each quadrant will explode when its penax triggers. You will probably forget all about this and die several times before it sticks. I sure as hell did. God damn it, I'm retarded. Fire also does two healer stacks instead of one big one. Lightning or water will always be first, and poison or fire will follow up. I'm going to show you every possible combination and go over exactly what to do. Lightning Fire is my favorite as a melee player. Stand close to the wall on the fire tile. Don't be any closer to the middle than I am here. After lightning triggers, all players will sidestep onto the lightning tile, and group 1 will pop sprint to rush under the boss. Like I said, this happens extremely quickly, so I would definitely always sprint to make sure you can get into position in time. Lightning Poison is easier for ranged, most of whom will simply pre-spread along the edge of the fire tile. Melee, on the other hand, will need to sprint into their assigned positions the instant lightning strikes. Again, not a lot of time, be fast, especially the main tank. Water Fire is what Group 2 wants to see. They just get knocked back to the wall and chill. Melee sprints forward as before. Make sure to be on Lightning, I'm telling you, it is so easy to forget. Water Poison is the most technical. Range wants to get knocked back into their pre-assigned positions. Melee will get knocked back to the wall and sprint to the flanks, just like on Lightning Poison. After a brief pause, the boss will teleport to the middle and prepare to shift in a cardinal direction. The trick here is that he always faces north. Spin your camera to look over his shoulder and it will be easy to tell where he's going. Immediately start moving in that direction. The next Pinax will trigger right before he completes his shift. It will always be lightning or water, whichever he didn't do. This is why we saved our knockback immunity, to make this part simple. Just pop it when the shift cast is halfway completed, run in the correct direction, stand to his side, and you will always survive. Sword or cape is completely irrelevant. If he does water and cape, you get double value, and melee don't even lose uptime, so hope for that. Thankfully, you will get a long pause before the next final Pinax, either fire or poison, goes off. No excuse for messing this one up. Depending on the shift, you may be next to the poison tile. If you're the melee player on that flank, chill directly under the boss so that all four of you can enjoy comfortable uptime. Just make sure you don't have a toe in the square. Time for another tank buster. Immune or swap as you like. 
Just remember that you need to devoke some time before the cast starts to immune both hits. You will suck every player and three of the four puddles before the phase ends. Remember this element, it will be safe in a little bit. Then, he'll reshuffle the squares around just to not make remembering where to go too easy. Orbs are coming up soon. Unlike normal mode, they will split damage and need to be soaked with a partner. Everybody will get an act and debuff. These signify which orbs you'll be soaking. Here are your positions. Tanks and healers always get acting DPS and will always go to these spots, but DPS will need to adjust depending on if they get acting tank or healer. He will suck everybody off before whipping out his balls. Each will lock onto and move after the closest player. Once they do, run through the boss, soak an orb with your partner, wait a second for heals, then get the next one clockwise. When you're done, quickly go to whichever square is safe to not die. Drag the boss north to make the next set of mechanics much easier. After more suck, two sets of towers will appear, very obviously communicating who needs to soak. Spoiler warning, he's gonna do another virus tether combination soon. The towers act just like the blood rakes from the start of the fight. Tower means weak, tower means don't do mechanic. The first set corresponds to tethers, the second to the virus. It's literally the same deal, except for the fact that he will do an extra round of tethers together with the first towers. The tethers are easy to think about this time. If you need to do them, you will need to do them again later. Having the boss to the north gives everybody easy access to their towers without creating chaos with the tethers. If you get the second set of towers, run right to the stack point after they land. The runner will come out fast. You know the drill from here. You'll now get a raid wide and a tank buster, just like at the start of the fight. He really likes repeating himself. The next thing Hesperos will try is to kill you with another round of Pinax. Nothing changes here. Not a single thing. It's literally the exact same sequence. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? Just keep a clear head and go through the exact same motions that you've been practicing. Two casts of Decalation will precede the Enrage from here, at about 7.15. There's no cast or anything this time. Ain't nobody got time for that. He will just pass or fail you instantly. He needs to be very close to 49%. Seeing 50 is unsafe. Keep beating the ever-loving shit out of him and don't let up until you see that number tick down to 49. Congratulations, you've pissed him off. Now the real fight begins. The core theme of Phase 2 is that he's gonna shit a bunch of thorns everywhere, telegraph a bunch of mechanics, then tether to them to show which order they'll be activated in. There'll be towers, big AoEs, tethers, a bunch of different stuff. There are six sets of mechanics that you'll need to understand. Some of them will look complicated at first, but don't be intimidated. You'll wrap your head around them once you see them in action a few times. First, everyone will take one of these markers which correspond to Act 1 towers. This set of markers is for Act 3 towers. Melees and tanks on one set, healers and ranged on the other. DPS, north and south. This will make more sense when we get there. The room's markers are mainly for Act 2. You'll just get a light raid wide before the first thorns drop. Act 1 is literally brain dead. Eight towers will spawn and four explosions on cardinals. After another raid wide, he'll pick a set of opposing explosions to do first, then the other. Simply move from the safe zone over your tower, soak, and continue on. As always, the floor is specifically designed to make positioning easy. See these diamonds? They're safe. Stand there. When Act 1 ends, he will cast Near Sight or Far Sight, tank busting the two nearest or farthest targets, respectively. Everybody needs to watch for and adjust to this. Be well away from the tanks on Near Sight, especially. Act 2 is the most complex to wrap your head around. An explosion and tower will spawn at each cardinal direction. Standard markers identify the towers to eliminate confusion between the two. Before anything too crazy happens, you'll do a split damage tank buster, so tanks just hug for that. All players will now be tethered to a partner, tanks to healers and DPS to each other. There are three colors of tethers. One tank or healer will have purple and the other guy won't have a color. Purple does a raid wide and a brief vulnerability. The other tank and healer pair will have fire, which does split damage around both targets when broken. You need a three man split to be safe. DPS will have another fire set and a wind tether. Breaking wind is very rude and you will die of embarrassment. They need to stay together until it expires. The way this works is that tanks and healers will be responsible for soaking towers and DPS is in charge of soaking fire tethers. The movement is simple enough once broken down. Just tunnel on your role's job at first so that you don't get overwhelmed. The first step is to identify if you're going east-west first or north-south. I like to look at this specific thorn to make it easy. It goes boom. If he picks it first, it's north-south. If second, east-west. This one is east-west. To reduce confusion, I'll complete the explanation using these directions. For north-south first, just rotate everything I'm about to say clockwise 90 degrees. Next, tethers will go out. Each side will need a healer. Purple takes east, fire west, and tanks will adjust accordingly depending on who they're tethered to. The purple tether will be broken immediately while everybody else waits mid for baited AoEs. Team Purple will drop their baits close to their towers and move to soak. One important note here. The explosions will cover half of the towers, so be on the far side when you're soaking. Once baits go out, the tank healer fire pair will move to break their tether. Wind DPS will go west, alliteration makes this easy to remember, fire DPS will go east to these offset markers. You're halfway done already. 
Now the fire DPS pair needs to break and will run north and south. Wind rotates clockwise to cover for one, together with their healer who will soak the next tower, and everyone else runs to the south for the other. Anyone can get the south tower, it really doesn't matter who, the paste bin has the healer doing it. And that's it. Not so bad, is it? But don't relax yet. He'll get his bigger raid wide before going right into Act 3. Four towers will spawn to the east and west. He'll trigger one side at a time randomly. There will also be a knockback thorn in the middle. For uptime's sake, ranged and healers will cover the first set while tanks and melee get the second. The first step in this sequence is a leaping kick to the furthest target. This will be baited by the tank towards the second set of towers to maximize uptime while healers and ranged go to soak the first set. It does a fairly large AoE, so don't be too close. Everyone needs to use their knockback immunity one or two GCDs after the kick. Shortly after landing, Hesperos will fire three cones at the three nearest players. Since the kick applies a vulnerability, these will be directed away by melee to the north and south while tanks swap positions. At the same time, towers will trigger on the other side of the room, followed by that knockback we were talking about. Melee and tanks will move to soak their set of towers while a healer positions to bait another kick across the room. More cones will come out fast. Range DPS north-south, healers swap out like the tanks did, and that's the end of that. Position for nearsight farsight and drag the boss back to the middle. Heartstake is yet another style of tank buster, which will put a heavy bleed on first and second threat. This one is typically immune by the off tank provoking during the cast, causing the main tank to be hit twice. Act 4 is the last demanding act. Eight thorns will alternate between tower and explosion around the edge of the room. A light raid wide will come out before thorns are telegraphed. Instead of an order of activation, all players will be tethered to a thorn and also get a color. Explosions tethered purple, towers tether blue. Remember purple? It's the raid wide with the Vuln from Act 2. Blue is new, it is not wind. Wind is more of a green color. It just does a large AoE around you when the tether breaks. Before breaking anything, you will need to wait for the boss to do another raid wide. Use this time to identify where to go. Purple players will simply move one position clockwise to soak a tower. Blue players will go across the room and clockwise one to break their tether on top of an explosion thorn, putting them well out of the way. Once the towers have been handled, the group will stack up to the south of the room and start breaking purple tethers, starting from the north. Rotate as a group clockwise until all are broken. Go as fast as you can, without stacking volumes. You need to be done before the next big raid wide happens. The meat and potatoes of the fight is now done with. It's all downhill from here. Act 5, or finale, is actually one of the easier acts. Eight towers will spawn in a circle. All players will then be tethered with wind to a north or south thorn. Spread out around your thorn and wait. Now we're going to perform this complicated maneuver known as... Counting. Hesperos will bomb all players in a random order. Whichever number shot you take will correspond to the tower that you'll need to soak. Once wind goes away, get a bird's eye view of the boss to make it easy to see which tower is number one. Then, match numbers. Easy. The last set of intermediary mechanics is Nearsight Farsight, Raid Wide, and Split Buster. There's only one more thing left to learn. Curtain Call is simple but unforgiving. Everyone will get tethered with purple to a thorn with different durations. The thorn itself does nothing this time, it's just an anchor point. Look at which thorn you get and run to the opposite side of the boss so that you can break quickly when your time comes. All you need to know about this is that DPS will move to break when their debuff hits 12 seconds remaining. Tanks and healers will move to break when they see 6. If one player is even a few seconds late though, you'll probably wipe, so pay attention. Two sets of pizza slices will also go out during this phase. These will rotate to hit safe zones shortly after firing, so move into the very middle of the first slice to avoid the follow-up. If you did Hades Extreme, it works exactly like Shadow Stream. If you die, your purple will trigger and almost certainly murder everyone, so it's super important to avoid these. A few unlucky players will have to dodge pizza while breaking, so be ready to. A lot of damage goes out in this phase, so healers need to be on point and get good value out of their tools. He'll throw out a big raid wide after Tether 8 as a bonus. So, since it didn't work the first time, he's gonna do it again for real this time. Except, not really. It's the exact same thing. That is crazy. DPS break at 12, tank heals at 6, dodge the pizza, and kill a vampire. A more standard slow cast and rage will kill you all at about 820. That's it, that's the tier! 100 percent That's the fucking tier! Ah, <sighs> sucks I don't get loot though, but at this point I think I just like to get them to the clear parties. Ah, uh, it took entirely too long. Da -na 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 -na. Yeah! Asphodelo Savage complete. We don't get loot, but at least we get a picture. Yeah. So that's the end of Asphodelos. This was my first year doing Savage, and it was a lot of fun. As a WoW refugee, I'm a big fan of the way this game handles challenging content. There's no nonsense, just gameplay. I might put out a video with my full thoughts on the comparison later on. As always, I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. May you be blessed.